Thank, thank you very much, um, Admiral and, and Bob. And, and again, I want to uh, thank all of you for being uh, with us and uh, also say a special greeting to our C-SPAN viewers. I'm Steve Clements with the New America Foundation. Um, as we went on uh, a little bit there to accommodate uh, the Admiral, and I should say right at the outset, you know, we're putting some provocative ideas out on the table and somewhat challenging, I think. Bob's book challenges some of the orthodoxies um, about the way in which we look at the deployment of power in dealing with some of these terrorist questions. And it has been heartening to see the support we've had, at least the engagement from the administration. We're doing a private dinner tonight. Unfortunately, it's off the record for all of the journalists who don't ask me. Uh, with Anne Marie Slaughter and Samantha Powers with the National Security Council and the State Department participating and with the Department of Defense. This is a, a sign of engagement with ideas and it's something that I think uh, needs to happen more. Um, so Bob was allowed to let the last session run a little bit over because he was taking time away from himself. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Bob Pape, of course, is, is the author of, of this new book that's just out this week, Cutting the Fuse. Um, I've already uh, read the book and, and, and find it very important. And also importantly, recently, as I mentioned, the launch uh, at the University of Chicago of the Chicago Project on Suicide Terrorism website, which I encourage everyone to take a look at. Bob is a professor of political science at the University of Chicago. He was also uh, author of, of um, uh, Dying to Win and Bombing to Win, uh, and spent a lot of time uh, talking to military officials about their strategies. So uh, my partner in this conference, Robert Pape, is now going to share uh, the core parts of his work. Please welcome Bob Pape. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, in 2004, Donald Rumsfeld uh, asked what I think was the pivotal question about the war on terror. Are we producing more terrorists than we're killing? Well, I study suicide terrorism. Suicide terrorism is the most virulent form of terrorism, killing more people by far than all the other forms. Over 10 times per attack, we can go into the, excuse me, into the details, but it's the lung cancer of terrorism. If we could stop lung cancer, we would save lots of people's lives. The same with suicide terrorism. So let's apply the Rumsfeld standard to suicide terrorism. In 2000, the year 2000, there were 20 suicide attacks around the world. One was anti-American, as this <laughs> mother just told us, the coal. Last year, in the last 12 months, there have been over 300 suicide attacks around the world, over 270 anti-American inspired. By the core metric that matters, we are producing more terrorists than we're killing. The war on terror has simply been an abysmal failure. But why? Why? What's underneath it? Where should we go? How should we move beyond the war on terror? Uh, as I said, uh, I spend my life almost <laughs> uh, collecting uh, information on suicide attack. Uh, you now know I'm the director of the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. Uh, I have a research team uh, of 10 people, many of them are here, uh, that collect information on suicide terrorist attacks all around the world, not just in English, but the key native languages associated with the phenomenon, Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, Russian. Uh, when you see Cutting the Fuse, you'll see that we've looked at all 2,200 suicide attacks around the world in the last 30 years, every single one we could find. I just want to show you a little bit about the data that this is built on. If you go to our CPOST website, we've put a phenomenal amount of data on the web for free for you to search and for you to export. Uh, and this may be especially helpful for journalists, folks in government, people doing research to generate reports on suicide terrorism. Um, I just wanted to show you a little bit about what's on the website. So you can go to our website, you can go search database, and you can find very nicely that we start to have great variables for you to search from 1980 to 2010. Um, I've just done a quick one here for you on Lebanon because most of you are familiar with Hezbollah, the famous suicide. So if you just toggle Lebanon, you'll end up with the next chart, which is the summary that there were 38 attacks during, uh, uh, from, uh, since 1980. Uh, but what's really important is how good is this data? How good is this data? Why are government officials paying attention to this? Not because of the summary, but because of what I'm about to show you now. You see, for each one of those attacks, you'll see view details. Well, you can then go and actually view the information on the attacks. And this isn't just number killed location. 
We often have names of the suicide attackers. We often have socioeconomic information about the attackers. But you still ask, how good is this data? Well, every bit of data here is corroborated. No anonymous internet chat room. Look at the sources underneath this. And this isn't just footnotes, because you can go to view sources and see the actual hard text verification of each and every bit of data. That is, we have put over 10,000 core documents on the web, uh, about four for each of those attacks. Um, and if you find a problem, you can just bring it to our attention. We'll fix it. <laughs> this is very reliable data, um, and it's something that uh, the government has been getting actually for some time, uh, certain parts of the government, and it's now available for free on the web, uh, and of course, it has the, pat the book is laying out for you the patterns of what you see in the data. So what do you see in the data? What I want to do is talk about suicide terrorism around the world in two parts. First, from 1980 to 2003, think about that as suicide terrorism before Iraq, and then from 2004 on. From 1980 to 2003, there were 343 completed suicide terrorist attacks, defined in the classic sense of an, of an individual killing himself, himself, or herself, herself on a mission to kill others. The world leader in that period is not an Islamic group. They're the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. The Tamils did more suicide attacks than Hamas. Just think about that for a moment. Further, over a third of all Muslim suicide attacks were by purely secular groups, such as the PKK in Turkey, which is another Marxist, read, anti-religious suicide terrorist group. Over half were not connected with Islamic fundamentalism. Instead, what over 95% of all suicide attacks since 1980 have had in common is not religion, but a specific strategic objective to compel a democratic state to withdraw combat forces. I don't mean advisors with sidearms. I mean tanks, fighter aircraft, and armor units from territory the terrorists consider their homeland or prize greatly, from Lebanon to the West Bank to Chechnya and now to Iraq and Afghanistan, every suicide terrorist campaign since 1980 has been waged by terrorist groups around this central objective related to ground forces threatening territory. This chart takes the 95% of the suicide attacks that fit that pattern, not quite 100%, but 95% do, and shows you the nine disputes that produce them. And as you can see, territory, important to terrorists, is central to each and every one of these disputes. Let me pick Lebanon, the famous example, uh, because many of you will know Hezbollah. In June 1982, Hezbollah did not exist. In June 1982, Israel invaded southern Lebanon with 78,000 combat soldiers, 3,000 tanks and armor vehicles. One month later, Hezbollah was born. Then, over the next year, for reasons we're still not quite sure why, Hezbollah began to experiment with suicide attack. And the fourth attack was the famous suicide truck bombing of our Marines in Beirut in October 83, killing 241 of our Marines. The same day, they did a suicide attack against the French, killing 58 French soldiers. Well, Ronald Reagan, certainly no pacifist, a few months later decided to withdraw all American combat forces from the country rather than face another suicide attack. The French left when we did, and then Israel left, first to, in 86 to a six-mile security zone in the southern part of the country, and then in May 2000, the Israeli army left altogether. Well, what's important about the withdrawals is that Hezbollah suicide attackers did not follow the Americans to New York or the French to Paris or even the Israelis to Tel Aviv. Since May 2000, there have been zero Lebanese suicide attacks, even during the summer of 2006 when we had this three-week war <laughs> between Hezbollah and Israel. My goodness, if this was just about Islamic radicals looking for a quick trip to heaven, we would have expected hundreds of suicide attackers 
uh, by Hezbollah in that in 2006, and yet we got zero. So what I'm saying is there's powerful evidence that foreign occupation is the trigger for both secular and religious suicide attackers, much like the way smoking triggers lung cancer. But let's go further and examine 9-11. This research is the first to collect the complete set of the 71 individuals from 1995 to 2004 who actually killed themselves to carry out attacks for Osama. Of those 71, we know the names, nationalities, and other socioeconomic data of 67. And as you can see, the largest com number come from Saudi Arabia, the vast majority from the Arabian Peninsula, where the United States first began to station combat forces in 1990. You see, 1990 was a watershed year in our military deployment to the Arabian Peninsula. Yes, before 1990, we had a few advisors with sidearms, mostly Marines with pistols standing in front of embassies, but no fighter aircraft, no armor units, going all the way back to World War II. 1990, we went in to kick Saddam out of Kuwait, which we did by uh, March 91. We never made a decision to stay. We just never left. And the Al-Qaeda attacks start five years later. But that's just statistics so far. What about the Al-Qaeda attackers themselves? I want to show you martyr videos from six of the most notorious Al-Qaeda suicide attackers. I want to show you four of the 9-11 hijackers. Uh, they're going to speak to you in Arabic, and so there's subtitles underneath so you can read them, uh, you can understand them. I'm also going to show you the martyr videos from two of the London bombers from July 2005. They will speak to you in English, and just let me let you listen to them. We'll bookend the English, so uh, a London bomber first, then the four 9-11 hijackers, then another London bomber. This is how our ethical stances are dictated. Um, your de democratically elected governments continuously perpetuate atrocities against my people all over the world. And your support of them makes you directly responsible, just as I am directly responsible for protecting and avenging my Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security, you will be our targets. And until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment and torture, of my people, we will not stop this fight. We are at war and I am a soldier.
وما بلاد الحرمين فيه من احتلال وتردي هو مخطط من اليهود والنصارى وعلى رأس من أمريكا دمرها الله التي ما نزل بالإسلام والمسلمين من مصيبة إلا كانت سببا فيها Well, you have witnessed now is only the beginning of a series of attacks which, inshallah, will intensify and continue until you put all your troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq, until you stop all financial and military support to the U.S. and Israel, and until you release all Muslim prisoners from Belmarsh and your other concentration camps. I know that if you fail to comply with this, and know that this war will never stop and that we are ready to give our lives 100 times over for the cause of Islam. You will never experience peace until our children in Palestine, our mothers and sisters in Kashmir, our brothers in Afghanistan and Iraq feel peace. So what is it about occupation that triggers the suicide attackers, secular and religious? Well, it's not one thing that an occupation does. Occupations can do multiple things. Uh, first, occupations can produce atrocities. Uh, that, of course, can produce revenge. Occupations can also create the environment in which people can become heroes for their community by throwing off the occupation. Occupations can also encourage people to become religious, even more religious, perhaps as a way to deal with this new found environment suddenly oppressing them. It's not that there's one specific, specific micro motive. It's that all those motives are linked to the occupation. And why the occupation in general is because when there are foreign ground forces on territory overseas, especially a power from a powerful country like the United States, local communities often believe, not always, but often believe they've lost control of their government. Well, many people in Saudi Arabia believe that it's the American relationship which is the only thing keeping the House of Saud in power, and that that government would be gone were it not for that relationship with the United States. I'm not trying to tell you they're always right, but what I am trying to tell you is, wouldn't, imagine if you would, that there was a Chinese army, 50,000 strong, in Maryland. Imagine that that Chinese army had a deal with the White House to be in Maryland. Does that mean that everybody in the United States would accept that? <laughs> Does that mean that, don't, would, would you be surprised that there would be people who would question that relationship? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised for a moment. Um, and it's not because I think that we're somehow more radical. I think it's because the occupation, that is that foreign military presence, can create the environment triggering all those symptoms we so often associate with suicide terrorism. Now, if this is right, if this argument is right, and I've only told you about up to 2003, uh, what should we expect if there's more occupation? Well, a lot like smoking and lung cancer. If there's more smoking, more lung cancer. And what we see is if there's more occupation, we get more suicide terrorism. You see, since 2004, there have been over 1,800 suicide attacks around the world. Uh, many times more <laughs> than from 1980 to 2003. And notice where they are. They're not scattered around the world as they would be if they were merely the product of religious fanaticism or any ideology independent of a circumstance. They're concentrated. They're concentrated tightly <laughs> around occupations. Now, for this pattern between the empirical connection between suicide terrorism and foreign occupation to be wrong, with 2,200 attacks now, we would have to have missed not just five suicide attacks around the world, not even 50. There would literally have to be hundreds of suicide attacks occurring somewhere around the world, not on this chart. I don't mean over undercounting Iraq. I mean in Mozambique, in South Africa, somewhere else on this chart. And while I don't think uh, I can credibly tell you we've got every single suicide attack around the world, although I don't think we've missed even five, 
I'm sure we haven't missed 200 in the last five or six years. You would know that. This is powerful evidence for the logic that's driving suicide terrorism against us. Moreover, notice how, again how many now are anti-American inspired. Uh, let me just say a few words about specific cases because uh, especially the ones most prominent, say Iraq. Iraq is a core example of this logic. Before our invasion in March 2003, Iraq never experienced a suicide attack in its history. Then, as you can see, the suicide attacks mount up until 2007. Then they come down in two big steps, first from 2007 to 2008, and then again from 2008 on down. Why? Why are, did they come down in this way? And let me explain each of the two steps. First, from 2007 and 2008, most people would instinctively say, oh, the surge. We put in more troops, and putting in more troops is what brought down well, let's take a look at that. These are the numbers of troops in Iraq by the Pentagon's numbers from in looking in September 06 to September 08. Look at the total number of US and coalition troops in Iraq. They actually go down during the surge. Why? Because while we were putting in 20,000 troops, our allies were leaving faster. We're essentially, for the country as a whole, backfilling for our allies leaving. But then you might say, well, wait a minute, maybe they were distributed in a certain way that uh, the key thing you need to know about suicide terrorism is that all the suicide terrorism in Iraq was Sunni, none from Shia, none from Kurds. We did have ordinary violence in a three-sided ordinary civil war happening side by side with the suicide attacks. But all the Sunni, I'm sorry, all the suicide terrorism was Sunni. Why is that? Well, remember, it was America who toppled the previous government, Saddam, a Sunni, and is replacing it with a non-Sunni government. So it's the Sunnis who feel most oppressed by the toppling of that government. They live in the in Anbar, the Sunni Triangle. Well, if that was the case, if that's the case, then we can look at the number of troops. And notice how we do put a few more troops in Anbar, but nowhere near what would be needed to suppress that insurgency, the Sunni part of it, according to General Petraeus's manual. Uh, we would have needed over 100,000 troops. What really mattered from 2007 to 2008 was the growth of the Sons of Iraq, the Anbar Awakening. What happened is, we paid 100,000 terrorists who were killing us $300 a month to basically do one thing. We want to do some other things too, but they had to do one thing to get the $300 a month check. Don't kill us. <laughs> they could buy guns. We want them to buy food. We want them to have jobs, but don't kill us. Well, they took the deal, <laughs> 100,000 of them. And why does that matter? Because with 100,000 self-empowered local group, a local group of that size, they can now feel confident about their way of life against the Americans, against the Shia-dominated government, against the terrorists. So they can just sit this one out. <laughs> That's why so much suicide terrorism came down in that period. And then further, of course, November 2008, that's when we signed the agreements to withdraw. And by the way, just look at how successful we have been. In the last two years, suicide terrorism is down over 85% in the country as we've pulled out over 100,000 troops. What about Iraq, Afghanistan? This is nearly the opposite story. <laughs> uh, in Afghanistan, before 2001, there were again, when we toppled the Taliban, there were again zero suicide attacks in that country during its whole history. Uh, they start in fall 2001. And then for the first few years, there are actually only teeny tiny number of suicide attacks. And then 2006, up. Suddenly, there's a spike and it stays high. Why? Why 2006? Well, first, the targets. Who's being struck? The green are US and NATO troops. So suddenly, which killing, getting the far lion's share of uh, the suicide attacks. 
why suddenly are suicide attacks in such large numbers occurring against U.S. and NATO troops in 2006? Well, who's doing them? We can identify and corroborate the identity of 93 of the Afghan suicide attackers. 90% are Afghan nationals. A few percent are from the border regions. Only 5% are from outside the region of conflict. This is not some global jihad swirling around the world. This is local opposition to U.S. and Western military presence. But still, why 2006? Well, maybe it has something to do with ground forces. It does, but not uh, it simply. Here's the curve of us putting ground forces in the country. And first thing you'll notice in 2010, this is the Obama surge, is that we've actually been surging 20,000 troops, U.S. and Western troops in Afghanistan, each of the last four years. Obama surge was just the last round of this. Um, but why 2006? Because that's actually quite a steady slope. The key thing you need to know is in those early years when we only had a few thousand troops in the country, they were occupying Kabul, not spread around the country, basically defending Karzai, until October 2003, when the UN gave us a mandate to spread around the rest of the country. And then, like a good military staff, ISAF developed a plan. And this is ISAF's actual plan. The map is ISAF's for spreading our forces, we didn't call it an occupation, our forces around the rest of the country. First, we went north our friends, the Northern Alliance, then West, more friends, and then starting in 2006, the South and East. That's when the suicide attacks explode against our troops in the South. Uh, those suicide attackers are not just Afghan nationals, they're Pashtuns from the South and the East. And oh, by the way, six months later, we have an explosion of suicide terrorism in Pakistan in the western regions of Pakistan, which are also Pashtun. Because while we're directly occupying the Pashtun homeland in Afghanistan, at the same time, we put pressure on Musharraf to take 100,000 Pakistani army troops, move them from the eastern part of the country, and put them on the western part of the country to essentially indirectly <laughs> occupy the other half of the Pashtun homeland. And over 75% of all those hundreds of suicide attacks in Pakistan have been against the Pakistani army in western Pakistan, uh, part of our indirect occupation of that part of the Pashtun homeland. Now, this is just not about the suicide terrorism over there. I want to talk to you about how Al-Qaeda recruits attackers here, homegrown terrorists. I want to show you Adam Gadon. It's crucial for Muslims. Uh, Adam Gadon is the poster child for recruiting homegrown suicide terrorists to kill us. His, uh, he's an American citizen. He's about 33 years old. He was born in Riverside, California. His name is Adam. When uh, his father was Jewish, when he was young, the family converted to Christianity, and then as a teenager, he converted to Islam. Well, in 2006, this was his coming out video. First time his face was shown. And I just want you to see his pitch for recruiting homegrown terrorists to kill us. And by the way, about two thirds of the way through, remember the Fort Hood shooting spree. It's crucial for Muslims to keep in mind that the Americans, the British, and the other members of the coalition of terror have intentionally targeted Muslim civilians and civilian targets both before as well as after September 11th uh, in both the first and second Iraq wars as well as in their forays into Somalia uh, and the Sudan and Afghanistan just to give you a few examples and they've done this with the support and backing of their populations and electorates I mean even if there have been some feeble protests scattered here and there in the West, chiefly against the latest war in Iraq. All the same, the governments who started these wars have been re-elected by a majority of the popular vote. In their aggression against Afghanistan, which for Westerners and uh, their mercenary sympathizers is the least controversial of Bush and Blair's terrorist wars, 
They have targeted civilians for assassination and kidnapping. They kidnapped any non-Afghans they found and shipped them off to Guantanamo or worse. Many were handed over to the American and British-backed despotic regimes of the Islamic world to be brutally interrogated. And uh, with the blessing and support of that notorious Afghan killer, Hamid Karzai, they've murdered thousands of Afghan civilians as they slept in their beds, traveled on the roads, attended weddings, and prayed in the mosques. I know they've killed and maimed civilians in their strikes because I've seen it with my own eyes. My brothers have seen it. I've carried the victims in my arms, women, children, toddlers, babies in their mother's wombs. You name it, they've probably bombed it. I could go on and on, and that's just how I stand. We haven't talked about American and British atrocities in the two Iraq wars. Uh, let's take a look at the latest to be revealed. In uh, Mahmoudia, five American soldiers gang rape an Iraqi woman, and then to hide the evidence, murder her and three members of her family and burn her body. And then, when our Mujahideen take revenge on the unit which committed this outrage and capture and execute two of its members, they're called terrorists, and Muslims are supposed to uh, disown them or face the consequences. And I'm not saying that we should go and slaughter their women and children one by one like they did ours at Haditha and Ishaqi and Mahmoudia and, and God knows where else, even if some of our legal experts have permitted that. And even if it's hard to imagine that any compassionate person could see pictures, just pictures, of what the, of what the Crusaders did to those children and not want to go on a shooting spree at the Marines' housing facilities at Camp Pendleton. But I, what I am saying is that when we bomb their cities and civilians like they bomb ours, or destroy their infrastructure and means of transportation like they destroy ours, or kidnap their non-combatants like they kidnap ours, no sane Muslim should shed tears for them. And they should blame no one but themselves, because they're the ones who started this dirty war, and they're the ones who will end it, by ending their aggression against Islam and Muslims, by pulling out of our region, and by keeping their hands out of our affairs. And until and unless they do that, neither force gate style police raids, nor Belmarsh or Guantanamo prison cells, nor the mosques and imams by advisory council will be able to prevent the Muslims from exacting revenge on behalf of their persecuted brothers and sisters. So no 72 virgins. From beginning to end, this is a call to respond to the plight of a kindred population under a foreign occupation. It's terribly important to see how Al-Qaeda thinks it can best recruit if we're going to develop policies to stop that process, cutting the fuse, getting them before they start. So what policies should we pursue? Uh, I don't believe we should simply cut and run, leave, pull our ground forces out of regions abruptly over six months, because we do have important interests overseas, we have important obligations overseas. Nor do I think we should simply stay and die, because we're producing more anti-American terrorists than we're killing. Rather, the alternative, this middle ground approach, is offshore balancing. It's the use of air power and naval power and economic and political tools and alliances with local groups to secure our interests overseas. This policy of offshore balancing we pursued for decades in the Persian Gulf in the 1970s and 80s and it worked splendidly. The policy of offshore balancing is what allowed us to rapidly deploy forces to the Persian Gulf ground forces to kick Saddam out of Kuwait. This policy of offshore balancing is what allowed us to topple the Taliban in 2001. In 2001, the Taliban controlled 90% of the country. What did we do in the fall? We put in 50 guys on the ground, we used air power, and then we used economic and political tools to empower the Northern Alliance, kicking the Taliban completely out, and Al-Qaeda as well. This is the policy we should pursue in Afghanistan, and I think more globally. Uh, in Afghanistan, I would transition to this policy over a three-year period of time. I would have a military freeze in year one, and then empower local groups focus on that. 
Year two, if that's successful, then I would redeploy our current troops in the south and the east to the north and the west. And then if year three were successful, that's when I would begin to withdraw the ground forces from Afghanistan. Uh, this, by the way, um, a, approach, this transition, is an approach that I also called for a few years ago in Iraq. It's what we're doing in Iraq that's stabilizing Iraq. And when I called for this in Iraq, many people said, oh, we couldn't possibly do that. We would embolden the terrorists, and then they would take ground. That's not happening in Iraq, and it's highly unlikely in Afghanistan because it's moving to offshore balancing that can truly cut the fuse of the fear and terror we face today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I have to admit, it's really hard to listen to Adam Gadon. Um, you know, and, and when I listen to him, I, I, I sense and hear a highly manipulative propagandist. Yeah. Uh, and I know this is an unfair question, but since you know a lot about these folks, it does seem to me that those running the show, no matter what, they're co are, are, are power players. Yep. And they're manipulating people, they're using a grievance, mm -hmm. the grievance being occupation or any other set of grievances to to compel their followers to do things. But I think these you know, people would try to find other mechanisms yep. uh, if, if the occupation weren't the grievance. And so I guess the unfair question I would ask you is if, if the occupation wasn't there, what do you suspect uh, the Zawahiris, the Bin Ladens, and, and, and this character would attempt to use to try to, as I don't think they're going to disappear. Yeah, I, uh, if we, I, if, you know, I don't so, think they'd be yeah. dis they, they'll disappear, but I think they're going to get awfully lonely. <laughs> I think that what's happening, Steve, is that I'm not trying to tell you that um, uh, Bin Laden in his heart of hearts wouldn't use any old excuse. I actually think he probably would. I think that uh, he is sort of a, you know, let's say a callous politician, so to speak. But just even the most callous politician, they need followers. The problem with the threat we face are the followers more than the leader. And what we've been doing by putting in the ground forces is we've been actually giving bin Laden his best meal ticket because that's the thing that recruits for him better than anything else. There may be teeny tiny other issues uh, that he could use as wedge issues, much smaller, but man, when we give him his best mobilization appeal to recruit, we're just open the doors. Uh, I want to open the floor. We've only got a few minutes uh, because Corey Shockey, uh, Flint Leverett, and Seth Jones are, are in the wings. Um, and I want to open, but I want to ask one other question. We have the Chief of Naval Operations here, and obviously he, he's into this uh, offshore balancing. <laughs> where, where is the Air Force? Is the Air Force, and, and, and have you talked to uh, the, the, the Army? I mean, just, just a quick profile on, on how you think the Navy and, and the Army are, are responding. Uh, respond to this? I, I think that what's happening here, Steve, is that in terms of official or even semi-official responses, what we're really seeing over the last year, actually just the last year, is the beginning of serious consideration inside the halls of uh, the Pentagon, inside key institutions in Washington. Um, I think that uh, it's because in the last few years, the data for this argument has become so much more robust. It's not that there weren't pieces of this available in my work, for instance, uh, earlier. It's the, it's look at the robust information we have. It's a lot like smoking and lung cancer. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing bit by bit by bit, the serious people really engage with this. Um, I think that... Um, serious uh, people, the Army and the Air Force? And I think, actually, the, the Army um, would have a tremendous interest in developing a rapidly deployable army, much like we did the RDF concept in the 1980s, which is what allowed us to rapidly deploy all those divisions to, uh, uh, to Kuwait, to kick Saddam out of Kuwait. That didn't just happen. There was a tremendous amount of thought that went into that in development, and the army, at least big parts of it, were very much behind it. And I think that it's really possible to build a robust coalition behind offshore balancing. Okay, let me open the floor. Uh, this, uh, is that Prescott? Prescott. Good morning, sir. Uh, thank you very much for open sourcing that data. It's um, very unique in its kind. I, um, I'm a Marine officer, first lieutenant down in Quantico, and um, I think there might be a good partnership with you and the uh, Center for Advanced um, Cultural Learning, I believe it is down there, CACL. 
Um, Marine officers are not only expected to be leaders, but also teachers. So using this information, uh, even if we're not at the higher levels, but sure. when at my level, this could be really informational and also useful in teaching our troops. Where do you see this um, being able to go, even with maybe adding some locational data that could interface with Google or something like that? Uh, actually, in terms of the specific locational data, we have GIS all our data, you know, um, using a little jargon here, sorry. <laughs> and so it, uh, we actually have multiple levels of locations, four levels of granularity. Um, and we have some of the folks here who are really quite expert in that. If you really want to know about that, um, we can definitely talk to you even uh, today. And so what we're putting on the web, we're going to actually put even more on the web as time goes on. But let me just speak to the public education point. You see, it's one thing to come to Washington, but Washington Washington itself, as you heard the congressman say, they're imprisoned by the environment. And so it's really important that many people see the information. Why is that? It's like smoking and lung cancer. In the 1940s, there were lots of questions about, does smoking really cause lung cancer? There were interests trying to prevent that word from getting out. What happened? What happened is the public came to understand smoking causes lung cancer. That's why we have better policies. Uh, I'll take uh, right here in the middle one, one last question. I would go back to you, but you've had a chance. I want to get some other voices in, uh, and we need to move to the next panel. Uh, this right here in the center. We'll make this the last one because I want to bring Corey Shockey and uh, Seth and, and Flint Leverett right up here. Thanks, Doctor. Jason Potter from the Navy staff. Has your research looked at how power projected from offshore, drones or otherwise, uh, not in occupation force, would be responded to by suicide bombers? Are we to believe suicide terrorism would be significantly reduced? if uh, power projection was sustained from offshore? Um, I don't think our research supports mass drone attacks in lieu of mass boots. <laughs> so if what, we, uh, uh, if what we look out into the future of offshore and say, oh, what we want to do is have thousands of drones killing uh, instead of thousands of boots on the ground, I don't think that we're going to be very happy. I think we'll see it, what that, that'll end up be calling aerial occupation. No, I don't mean offshore balancing to be that, mass drone attacks. What we mean is there will still be an offshore balancing strategy, as you heard the Admiral lay out very clearly. He's interested in using economic tools, political tools to uh, push American interests and develop good policies on shore but there will be times when force is going to be needed. And those times, it's best with air power and naval power. Ground forces. I want to thank, I think one of the most, you know, before Bob leaves, I think one of the most interesting uh, misassessments, I think, of your work that I've read about in the blogosphere is that you're read as some sort of a pacifist. Let's pull the military out. And I think that anyone that listens to this knows very clearly that is in fact not the case, that you're talking about alternative ways of securing the foreign policy, national security objectives, uh, et cetera, without undermining. So thank you very much, for Bob, Bob for uh, thank making you, that presentation. You. Very much, sir. Thank you. And let me invite. There really is uh, no one more um, better, better positioned to talk about where we are with the war on terror, uh, the need to move beyond the war on terror or not. Uh, and also to help us think about this both in the objective reality and then the politics of the war on terror. Then our next speaker, Governor Thomas Kane. Governor Thomas Kane served as the chairman of the 9-11 Commission, which was responsible for investigating the causes of the 9-11 attacks and providing recommendations to, future, uh, to prevent future terrorist attacks. This is the most important national security commission in U.S. history since the investigation of Pearl Harbor in the 1940s. A Republican two-term governor of New Jersey, Governor Kane won re-election in 1985 with the largest margin of victory in the history of New Jersey gubernatorial races and left office as one of the most popular political figures in the state's history. He went on to serve as the president of Drew University for over 15 years, and today, Governor Kane is one of our country's most thoughtful leaders, and his remarks today are sure to help America meet the challenge of asymmetric threats going forward into the future. Please join me in welcoming Governor Kane. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Probably too kind introduction, but I enjoyed it. So thank you very much. And 
thank the New American Foundation. This is an extraordinarily important conference here today, and, um, and I was going to make a big contribution. Uh, this is an enormously important issue. I was, I was asked to talk uh, on the topic of, basically, is America safer? And the simple answer, this is since 9-11, the simple answer is yes, we are safer, but not safe enough. And I think we know that. We're still not doing all the things we should be and have to do to keep us as safe as we really should be. Uh, that's sort of the topic of a group that uh, Lee Hamilton and I have set up here in Washington called the National Security Preparedness Group. It's sort of a successor to the 9-11 Commission housed at the Bipartisan Policy Center here. And our mission is two things. One is to continue to look at the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission and see how many of them and how thoroughly they're being implemented. And secondly is to see perhaps how the, how the threat has changed. It's been almost 10 years now and the threat is not the same and whether it's how different is it and whether in fact our policymakers are responding to the new threats. Uh, in, in this capacity, Lee and I are often asked, how has it changed? And are the recommendations being implemented? And so what we did when we formed the group first was meet with numerous senior officials in our government, almost everybody involved with this particular question, and asked two of the terrorism experts in our group, Professor Bruce Hoffman of Georgetown University and Peter Bergen of the New American Foundation, to help us answer the question. Now, I know Peter's coming later. Uh, Peter, Peter Bergen's on your program for today's event, and I want to particularly recognize his expertise on this subject. It's been enormously helpful to us. But let me summarize a bit some of the things that we found. First, we started from the assumption that it's been six long years since we made our report on the 9-11 Commission, and therefore it was appropriate to do a new look and a new assessment. I, I, I think it's also significant that it's been three long years as well since the last publicly disseminated U.S. government threat assessment. And this, as you remember, was a national intelligence estimate produced by the National Intelligence Council back in July of 2007. So as we talked with our group, we thought it was enormously important before we begin the rest of our work of making recommendations to establish the foundation. And the foundation was to decide what is the threat today? And how does it differ? And how serious is it? How has it evolved and changed since our report? And even since the National Intelligence Assessment of three years ago. And before I talk about that, let me say that we believe very strongly that although the world has changed, that most of the recommendations which we made are as important today as they were when we made them almost six years ago. And I'll go over just three of them briefly, because they are important. One is we found almost our number one recommendation. We found that the problem was before 9-11 that all of our 17 or 18 intelligence agencies simply weren't talking to each other enough. And because there was a culture of secrecy within the agency, you don't work for some of those agencies unless you can keep secrets, well, that's the way they brought up. And they kept secrets, as we know, even from one another. For instance, we know, or we suspect, that if the FBI and the CIA had actually been talking to each other at that point and sharing the information each of them had about some of the 9-11 conspirators who were then in the United States plotting, that is very, very possible by that sharing of information that that plot might have been disrupted. So information sharing. And we decided to implement that by making sure there was somebody at the top of the system. So there was a director of national intelligence responsible, if necessary, for banging heads together to make sure that information sharing was taking place. I will tell you, in my view today, while information sharing is much, much better, it's not where it should be. And we found that out with the Christmas Day plot. There was still, among agencies, information that each of them had. They didn't share with each other and 
perhaps if they had again, that fellow would not have been allowed to get on that plane headed for Detroit. Uh, also the Director of National Intelligence. The legislation that we recommended was that we set up a very strong Director of National Intelligence because it had to be strong in order to get these agencies to work together. The legislation that so often happened was changed in Congress and it was weakened and made a little vaguer. And that is a concern because there now have been some problems with the structure of the Director of National Intelligence and suspicion as to whether or not he has the powers to control and to regulate the various areas of intelligence in the United States government. That's a continuing problem and we've called, our group has called as, some, as of a number of congressional committees for the President of the United States to make sure that he gives the DNI full authority to the job which we think he has to have in order to make sure this information is shared properly among these various agencies. I'll mention only one more recommendation and I'll go on to the future. Almost all of our recommendations were implemented by Congress to some degree, except one. And that was a recommendation involving the United States Congress itself. Maybe that's not surprising, and actually the members of the commission who had been served in the United States Congress said that is your most difficult recommendation, but it's very important also, and it has not yet been implemented. Intelligence, remember, is secret by its very nature. We can listen, you and I, to the recommendations going on before the Transportation Committee, the Environmental Committees, the Tax Writing Committees. We can't go listen to the Intelligence Committee because what they're hearing is secret. So the press and the public does not get involved as they do in other areas than debate. Now what that means is that the Congress has a peculiar responsibility in this area because if they don't oversee the intelligence establishment properly, nobody does. There's no other group set up to do it. So the intelligence committees of the Congress have to do it and have to do it well. And yet at the time of the 9-11 and afterwards, members of that committee have told me personally and recently as last year they used the same word, our oversight is dysfunctional. The uh, Homeland Security Department reports now to over 90 different congressional committees. And that means the directors of that department, those cabinet secretaries, spend a lot of their time testifying or preparing testimony before the committees rather than doing their job. That's not proper oversight, 90 different committees. That's, the leadership has got to do something about that. Secondly, the intelligence committees themselves have no budget oversight whatsoever. Now, many of you know this town very well. And you know the Congress. So you also understand what the agencies respond to and who controls the dollars. If you don't control the dollars, you don't get a lot of attention from the various agencies of government. If you do, you get a lot of attention. They don't control the dollars. So the result is that often the intelligence committees cannot get the information they really need in order to do proper oversight. And that hadn't changed. So we still believe strongly in our recommendation here that you've got to give proper oversight to Homeland Security by less committees, and you've got to give the intelligence committees some sort of budget oversight so the intelligence agencies pay, pay attention to them so they can do the proper job of oversight because they're not doing it now and they'll tell you they're not doing it now, and that's important for the future. Now let me talk about the future. Uh, we believe that the threat at this time has both diversified and become much more complex than it has been at any time since the actual attacks on 9-11. And it's of concern to me that there is no single profile of a terrorist threatening the United States today. What we see is an adversary that is in essence is drawn from all sectors of society and every single walk of life. Uh, 
These, these include persons born in Afghanistan, Egypt, Pakistan, and Somalia, residents of the United States, in many cases naturalized American citizens, but also in the past few years what we've seen increasingly for the first time is American citizens themselves. That is people born in the United States gravitating or being summoned through the clarion call of terrorism, or as we might say, jihad, and they're getting it over the internet. We discovered that the perpetrators or the people plotting either to commit terrorist acts in this country or to travel overseas to receive training in terrorist camp, that people who were young and people who were old, male and female, married and unmarried, had children, didn't have children, they were well-educated. Some of them, like Fazal Shahad, as you know, had an MBA, a Master's of Business Administration. Others were high school dropouts, or even jailbirds, or ex-cons. We encountered people who would have self-described as petite, blue-eyed blondes, who can easily blend in in close quote. And that was, of course, how Colleen LaRose, who we call Jihad Jane, described herself. That's as well as a well-hardened terrorist operative such as Chicago and David Headley, whose reconnaissance, as you remember, was responsible for a lot of the success of the November 2008 Mumbai attacks staged by a very close ally of Al-Qaeda. He was, by the way, continuing after that to carry out reconnaissance using the United States as a base for future terrorist attacks on behalf of Al-Qaeda or other Pakistani groups. We also found out that the leadership of these terrorist mo uh, movements that threaten the United States is becoming increasingly Americanized. What do I mean by that? I mean, key operatives, someone like Adan Shigazama, I don't pronounce that right, in, at Al Qaeda Central, or whether it's someone like Anwar al Akawi in Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or whether someone like Omar. Amani, al-Shabaab, Al a Somali ally of al-Qaeda. And what we see in all these cases are Americans, people with our passports, people who are born here, people who are citizens of our country, going abroad, getting some training, making common cause with terrorist groups. And that is something that has to be, for us, fundamentally new and fundamentally disquieting. Finally, we concluded that the attacks and plots of the past year or so are not one-off events. They're not isolated things. We should look at one by one and say, well, that was unusual. Rather, we believe they're a part of a broader strategy embraced by our adversaries, by Al-Qaeda, its affiliates and associates, to try, if they can, to flood us, in essence, with multiple threats and threats coming from all sorts of directions and all different adversaries. We found, and this is also worrisome, that the United States has failed to adequately understand and prepare for these threats. There was a prevailing conviction of those we talked to that, ex that existed long past its shelf life that it couldn't ever happen here. That the communities of the United States were not communities that spawned terrorists. Uh, we thought we were too affluent much better educated and more diverse than similar communities elsewhere, particularly in Europe or the United Kingdom. And somehow that the American melting pot would establish sort of a firewall and to prevent radicalization and recruitment in this country. Yet, this has not proven to be the case. It was a case before 9-11. Everybody for 9-11 plot came from abroad to do us harm. So all our efforts since then has been to make sure they didn't get on planes, to watch people who were coming from other countries, particularly other countries that might be suspected of harboring terrorists. But this is something new. It's a new trend. It's an alarming trend. And we better get on top of it. This is a threat that's more complex, more diverse, and we encountered at any time since September 11th, 2001. Now, another disturbing thing we discovered there is no single government agency responsible for identifying radicalization. A 
and trying to stop recruitment. It may be that we need some kind of a multi-agency strategy where they all get together, but that concerns me, especially because our experience in the 9-11 Commission was that if it's everybody's responsibility, then it's nobody's responsibility. Moreover, we found it is not even clear which agency among the vast array of agencies in the intelligence and law enforcement community in the United States, which agency should have the lead responsibility here for radicalization and recruitment. And they've told us the issue needs further study. We hope here that terrorists, what they're looking for, of course, is our Achilles heel. We need a strategy to deal with this growing problem and its emerging threat. The diversity of this array of recent terrorist recruits thus present new and even greater challenges to the intelligence community and to law enforcement agencies across this entire country. And we realize that many of the agencies are already overstressed and inundated with information and leads, and now they have to run down a new panoply of threats coming from multiple dimensions and a variety of actors and organizations. In some, what we found out is the threat is very different than the threat which faced us on 9-11. It's changed profoundly. Today, America faces a dynamic threat that is diversified to a broad potential array of attacks from shootings to car bombs to simultaneous suicide attacks to attempted in-flight bombings of passenger aircraft. And this is a state of affairs so different than it was at the time of 9-11. Let me conclude. We said in 9-11 in our report that part of the problem was a failure of imagination on behalf of the US, US government. They didn't really get ahead of the problem. They, they knew about Al-Qaeda. They knew about bin Laden. They knew about all the attacks abroad. They never really imagined that they could pull off something as they did in our own country. This is something, again, which requires a rethinking and a new thinking of our strategy. We're doing a lot of work on this under the leadership of Birgit and Hoffman and the group that I'm working with. We're consulting with experts. We're meeting with everybody we can in the administration regarding recommendations that this country might adopt to deal with this new threat. But the one thing we cannot do is fight the last war. One thing we cannot do is continue to make things based on the threat and what happened in 9-11. We have to look at this new threat. We have to look at this, in my mind, as a new strategy. And we have to use all the resources of our intelligence agencies and the United States government, and most importantly, our citizenry as a whole, because I've often said that it's not going to be good as they are and hardworking as they are. It's not going to be the CIA or the FBI or federal agencies that are probably going to discover the next plot. It's going to be some citizen who has the confidence to tell his local policeman that something's wrong, and the local policeman has got to have the contacts and the confidence to call somebody in the federal government to get people on top of it. Remember, in the case of the bombing in Times Square, Times Square is probably the area of the United States with the most police coverage. More policemen per square, whatever, yard there, probably than any place else in the United States. Yet it was a street vendor who found that illegally parked van with the bomb in it. So at this point, we, call, we have to call on everybody. But we have to have a strategy. And that's what we're trying to develop now with our small group, that's what I believe and I hope the United States government will be trying to, trying to get on top of in the, in the next days and months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Uh, we will be taking questions. Um, and so at the moment, by the way, we only have just uh, one mic. It turns out Steve must have set down a mic. <laughs> uh, and, and Ezra, you're going to be our lone mic. So if folks over here uh, just for now could um, start to put their hands up, and then we'll be moving around. OK, so Ezra, and while we're moving the mic, sir, um, you uh, presented uh, really quite an illuminating picture mm -hmm. of the threat today. 
But I also wanted to ask you a question um, to reflect on your experience as being on the forefront of trying to bring change to make us safer. Hmm. Uh, there's, um, is, you described also uh, the difficulty of change. And I just wonder if you'd help us understand, are we facing simply bureaucratic inertia to be overcome? As no one really has tried to produce as much change as you. And can you help us understand the difficulties of change? I think change is always difficult in almost <laughs> anything, particularly so in Washington, particularly so in a bureaucracy. It's just very, very difficult. Let me give you the example. Uh, let's take one of our lead and wonderful agencies in this country, the FBI. The FBI is truly a wonderful group of people, but they were trained by the late J. Edgar Hoover. And what they were trained to do was to build up surveillance of people, build up enough evidence, make sure you have enough evidence to take them to trial, convict them, and send them away. And the FBI did that superbly for a number of years. Now we're asking the FBI to do something completely different. We're asking the FBI to surveil people, yes, but to pass on hints perhaps to other agencies of things that might be wrong to build up evidence not to necessarily put somebody in jail, but to prevent a plot which could kill a lot of their fellow citizens. If you think about that, that's a whole new thing. And to have somebody who's been trained to do the other suddenly to turn around and do this is very difficult. Taking the same agency. The top people in the agency have always been the agent. You've heard about them, there have been movies about them, television shows about them. The agent who goes and arrests somebody, you know, they're, they're heroes, and that's the top people in the agency, the people who are most respected, the people we all, we all like. Now, it's not necessarily the agent. The agent brings back information. That information has to be put together with a whole bunch of other information gathered from other places by the analyst. And the analyst becomes perhaps the most important people. But the analyst is not respected as if they were most important. They're not paid as if they're most important. So we have trouble keeping good analysts in these various agencies. And yet if you think of the thousands and thousands of people who collect information, that analyst may be the most important person of all because they're putting together the pieces of the puzzle in order, to, in order to get these people and convict them. Not convict them, but stop the plots. Well, that's one example. I mentioned Congress. I don't know how you change Congress. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I've watched Congress as you have for years and years and years. There's some wonderful, wonderful people in the United States Congress, but they don't change. I mean, we testify, Lee Hamill and I have testified again and again before these committees. And we've said to them very openly that your, uh, your the way you conduct your oversight of intelligence agencies is, and we've used the word dysfunctional because that's the word they use. And they nod. And they say, yes, it is. <laughs> but then it goes up to the important people, the appropriators, the people who control the Congress, and they don't want to change. They like the fact that Armed Services has control over the intelligence budget, hmm. even though they haven't got time to pay attention to it. They like the idea that they don't want to change that control. So nothing changes. So change is very, very hard. And the only way I know of, uh, for instance, every, look, as far as I'm concerned, maybe there's one or two out there somewhere. Every single candidate for Congress last time around, I suppose this time around too, but last time around, pledged themselves to the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. Right? Every single one, as far as I know, that came back to Washington having been elected or re-elected. One of the main recommendations is about changing the Congress. Nothing happened. <laughs> I mean, that change is very, very difficult. But the only way I know to do it is to keep on working at it. After 9-11, we had tremendous momentum behind the commission. I mean, Lee and I, and we testified, they all came and they all listened. They came back from vacation even to help work on the. So we had a lot of momentum going for us now. Now. It's a little bit more difficult. We don't want to wait left for another attack when the momentum comes back. We want to change these things now. Get better information sharing. Get a stronger DNI. Get the FBI and CIA to even be better in their information sharing. I and mean, we've got to, and I could go on, but there's, there's a lot of things we have to do. And 
The only way we're going to get done is for people like you and I to keep on pushing it. And sooner or later, the world gives way. But it's tough. And we're definitely doing that. So, yes. Thank you very much. I'm Benjamin Tua, an independent analyst and former Foreign Service officer, retired. Uh, my question is at two levels. How is it that the terrorist threat has become more uh, uh, developed and complex, as you say, and to what extent have our foreign policies or our failure to adjust these policies continued uh, contributed to this complexity and this new trend? It's a very good question. There's no, if we listen to what the terrorists say, I'm not saying we should change our foreign policy, but I am saying it contributes. Uh, if you listen to what they say, when, when bin Laden himself spoke originally in the original fatwa, he said there were two things he mentioned. Uh, one was our support for Israel and lack of the Palestinians, uh, and lack of help for the Palestinians, and the other was we had troops on the holy soil, because at that point we had some troops in Saudi Arabia. Uh, those are the two things he mentioned. And you can read these statements, and they do mention, you, you know, they want, you know, they want us out of the entire region. They don't want any American troops there. They don't want Amer any, Amer any Americans there at all. Uh, so, you know, you can, you can look at it that way, but we are not going to change, I don't believe, our support for Israel. I don't think we're going to change a lot of the things where we have to feel we have to leave American troops in certain places to protect our own security as well as the security of our friends. We can change the way we approach it. I think we have to do, I saw somebody earlier, one of the most neglected areas of the whole 9-11 report is the soft policy area where we recommended a whole bunch of outreaches to the Arab world, um, similar to the kind of things we did in Eastern Europe after, uh, before the breakup of the Cold War. When we had all sorts of information agencies, we had exchanges, we had a, uh, education programs, we had a whole bunch of things to try and show them who we were, who we really were, not who the propagandists told us that we were. Uh, I still think we can, we can do a lot more of that. Uh, why has it um, changed? I think it's a deliberate strategy. Uh, we were very successful in stopping people who wanted to do us harm, who had passports from other parts of the world. Uh, very successful. We, we have a wonderful, if you go visit this, we can see now in an agency in Washington, you can go there, uh, I have, and you can see everybody who's getting on every plane for the United States anywhere in the world. And the idea is to stop some of these people before they even get on the plane. That's been, but they recognize that's been successful. They also, Al-Qaeda for years, Bin Laden wanted to do something big. I mean, he said the only thing that's going to stop them is if we could do a nuclear explosion on their soil. He wanted two of them. So it was uh, trying to do something big. Well, we've stopped that, made that more and more difficult. And then they saw that these smaller plots seemed to disrupt us too. So I think the new strategy is, oh, let's, let's see if we can get people who don't look like <laughs> we look like in our part of the world, people who are American citizens, and let's see if we can do some smaller attacks and see if that doesn't disrupt them. And so that's the new strategy. And I don't, I don't believe it's something that happened by accident. I believe it's because the old one isn't working, they're going to a new one. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kami Bhatt, and I write for the Pakistani Spectator. Uh, my question is that our friend Israel is spending like less than 5% on terrorism prevention, but they are a lot more successful than we are. So aren't we kind of... Uh, by our very high rhetoric, encouraging terrorism by getting a lot more attention than we deserve it. For example, in Israel, whenever you have this kind of nonsense things, after like 15 or 20 minutes or after our people just go on with their lives, they don't make it big issue. In Pakistan, we are losing at least 3,000 people per year. We have lost since September 11, 30,000 civilians we have lost 1,000 Pakistani troops. And we have, Pakistan is a dirt poor country. We are spending so, wasting so much resources of that poor country on this nonsense, just because it has become a kind of industry. 
to waste, we can afford in America to waste billion of dollars, but those poor countries like India, Pakistan, they cannot afford. So is there any solution, thanks? Yeah, and that's a very good question, and a question also that is uh, very much, uh, not as publicly, but very much in discussion now in the halls of the United States government. Uh, the idea is, um, look, probably no matter what we do, one of these people are going to get through. And if they do get through and do a small-scale attack somewhere, uh, and it really disrupts life in this country, and it's seen as the biggest thing that ever happened to us, then it's going to encourage more of those attacks. And what they're talking about is how do we make the American people understand that it may occur at some point, a small-scale attack, but that we have to then go on with our lives. We can't make it the be-all and the end-all, or it's going to encourage more of the same attacks. And uh, I don't think they've come up with a way of doing that, and I don't think that they haven't been too public about it, because no, nobody in the federal government is going to step aside and say, well, if there's one attack, you know, <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, they're not going to say that. But there is that discussion, based on your point, going on very much, and it is very, very important that if one of these guys does get through and is a small-scale attack, that we don't make it into the biggest thing in the world, because that just encourages them, that we go on with our lives and show them there's nothing they can do basically, to disrupt the American way of life. That'll be the best thing we can do if one of these guys does get through, but uh, it's a good question. Yes, sir. Uh, Joshua Vogel, um, you talked about information sharing earlier in your uh, talk, and I was hoping to get your thoughts on the potential for uh, s implementing standards and practices for uh, integrated risk management throughout the country, and what your thoughts would be is if that would be helpful in terms of thwarting terrorism in the future. Integrating management of, of what? Of integrating risk management. Oh, risk management. Yes. Oh, yes. And in, in fact, um, uh, this can be enormously helpful. And of course, the biggest ally we have on this, was done properly, is the private sector. And a lot of companies have done that now. Have a very. I sit on a board, and we go over at least once a year. We go over with the board of directors what procedures we have for risk management what would happen to our records, what would happen to everything else, and what we're going to do in case there was a disruption. Uh, we also, companies, and some of you may be part of some of them, go through drills. And if something happened to the building, it might not be an attack, it might be a natural emergency of some sort, but what happens to the employees? Where do you go? Where do you congregate? How do you keep in touch? How do you know everybody's all right? And there are plans in I believe most of the major, not all of the very major corporations, and it's spreading now to smaller business. But yes, this kind of integrated uh, risk assessment throughout the United States, uh, and cities are doing. I mean, I, I've talked a lot with Mayor Bloomberg because New York consists, continues to be the threat, and um, it's a lot better. I mean, they've done a lot better. When 9/11 when, when happened, nobody knew who was in charge. We were talking about this earlier on a couple of us, and y you know, when somebody. It was, it was the first one in the scene. The fire department got there first, they were in charge. Policemen, they were in charge. Nobody really knew who was in charge. Well, he's centralized that now. So he's taken on whatever the political risks were of saying, all right, the police department, you're in charge. And the police department has its own anti-terror union. They actually have some people abroad who are working with them. They have a wonderful apparatus anti-terror in, in the city itself but the police are the ones who are in charge in case of any incident. And that's, every city ought to do that, every state ought to do that. Everybody ought to know, and it doesn't, it's not just terrorist attacks, it's hurricanes, it's floods, it's whatever the emergency is. When that emergency strikes, it's too late then to worry who's in charge. Everybody should have a plan. I know they have one in my own state, New Jersey, I know they have one in New York, I'm just not sure about the rest of the country. Uh, sir, so far you've told us a lot about the value and also the obstacles of change uh, in uh, the FBI, in Congress, uh, now uh, at local police departments. If there was one change, just one change that you could magically produce over the next, say, two years, what one change would that be? You've, you've heard me. I'm tempted to say the Congress. <laughs> but the, that may the, be good uh, enough. To say that. Now, if it, if it was one change, uh, I think still, still we have so many. I mean, it's it's this is a very very difficult job. If you think about it, 
We have millions of bits of information coming in all the time. Uh, and coordinating them, let alone sharing them, is an immensely difficult task. I don't want anybody to believe this is easy. This is very, very difficult. But I think if there's one thing I could do, it was make that information sharing seamless. Ah. So you had a, an area where it all came in and, and you had uh, top analysts who were paid and recognized for what they do and uh, there to make sure, because that would do more than anything else, I think, to prevent these things. Yes. Hello, um, I'm Samira Daniels, uh, Ramsey Decisions. Um, Governor Kane, I, I'm uh, um, very concerned with the whole issue of the quality of intelligence. And when I say that, I want to distinguish it by saying that I believe that in, in being intelligent is, a, is an intelligence. <laughs> and from that uh, vantage point, I think that unless the quality of intelligence and the analytical product and uh, language skills and these things are not improved, you're going to be spinning the, the wheel. And I think, I'm sorry to say this, and uh, I have deep respect for Lee and you, uh, but I just think that you're um, dealing with it at a level when the problem is at another level. Well, uh, I don't have any, uh, uh, reason I'm pointing out the importance of analysts is to get at what you're talking about. and and, and it starts at one level where you collect the information. Then it goes to another level where you analyze the information and share it, presumably. That's the kind of terrorism center. And then it goes up to leaders who hopefully understand what they're getting and can transmit that and form policy on that basis. Uh, it is very important, for instance, who and how the president gets his daily briefing. Now. Each president does it differently. Uh, president Bush, the last President Bush, liked to have people come in and tell him in the morning, verbally, you know, what the threats were and all of that. This president likes to read it, <coughs> because that's the way he gets information. And then he calls somebody if he wants to talk to them about it. Uh, but it's very, very important that the right person be there. Uh, we said it had to, we thought it had, ought to be the DNI. Uh, and it worries us if it's not the DNI. Director of National Intelligence, but that, that's, you're absolutely right. The, the whole system doesn't work if it breaks down at any level. And it's got to go right up to the president, and ultimately the president's the one who's got to be responsible. Uh, yes, sir. Again, sorry to hog the mic. My name is Robert Dubois. Governor, thank you very much for coming out. I'm, thank you. I spoke a little bit earlier about uh, the soft power approach, and you're talking about soft power like we did in post, -night, post, uh, post World War II. Uh, the soft power that Joseph Nye talks about is, uh, is the Japanese picking up baseball and bobby socks, not by force, but being attracted to it, the attractiveness. Um, this isn't what I was, uh, wanted to speak about, but you talked about um, reaching the, the, the police forces of America. Before I retired from the Navy about four years ago, I attacked bases all over the world as a terrorist, and I did speak to local commanders. I, I did a presentation called Think Like the Terrorist to a Sheriff Jim. Sheriff Jim was in uh, the central states, and he, he asked me, you're from D.C., what does it mean to have these color charts? What do I do when, there's a, when we're at Fuchsia? What do I do when we're at Orange? And uh, I told him, we need to communicate better. I want to approach you with that question. How do we communicate better to 300 million Americans, and I think that's really the key in, in getting what you say for the detectors on the street finding the terrorists. This Thank is you. Absolutely essential. Uh, the first thing I think we have to recognize is that we don't want to scare anybody, because that's not helpful. But we've got to let people be concerned, and we've got to let them understand what this new threat may be, and that probably if they see something, and this is the way it's changed. For instance, uh, you know, right now, if I'm sitting on a plane, right, and I look across the aisle and somebody's starting to light their shoe, <laughs> I'm going to jump them and so is everybody else on the plane. Uh, that's new. <laughs> new. That would happen before. We've got to alert people so that if they see something suspicious, they know who to go to and they know who to call. But then that's the first link. The second link is who they call 
has got to have confidence because for years, you know, those are sort of looked, you know, federal agencies sort of looked down on state agencies, state police sort of looked down a bit on local police, and you had this, you know, this hierarchy of things. Now it's got to be much more seamless if this is going to work. Uh, there's, there's got to be the citizen, getting with local law enforcement person, the law enforcement person knowing just who to call, and that call getting paid attention to by people at the level and evaluate. Now they're working on that. Right? This is not new. They're working on it. Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult because it's, again, overcoming years and years and years and years of, of doing something another way. But we all know that has to happen. And I honestly believe the federal, state, and local agencies are now working on it. And I know I have talked to local police who tell me not the way they'd like to see it, but they're given a lot more respect. And it is, uh, it is starting to happen. Uh, sir, could I just ask a question yeah. to follow up on one of your earlier comments about differences across administrations? Yeah. You mentioned uh, you had a great story about how President Bush likes to receive versus Obama, but could you just expand a bit? You've watched now a new administration come in. There's undoubtedly been pluses and minuses. Uh, could you just sort of help us understand that as we've seen a change of administrations, uh, have areas that have gone better, areas that you might have expected more? Could you just help us get a better sense of the differences? Yeah, I, I, I have great respect for the people that President Obama has appointed. Uh, the people I've worked with, um, John Napolitano, I think is a first class uh, cabinet member. Uh, there are uh, a number of other people who are in the intelligence area, a director of the FBI who's now been there for two administrations, Bob Mueller, I think is one of the best public servants I've ever worked with. Uh, so the people, the people are good. Uh, because he was, his administration was so, so dominated by 9-11, I think the Bush administration spent tremendous resources and tremendous interest and did a lot of good things, did some things that may not be so good, but they were concentrated in the area. Huh. Uh, this president has been distracted, understandably so, by all sorts of other things, by trying to get a health care bill through, by mm. an economy that simply doesn't seem to respond to whatever they've been trying to do to it, to... Uh, uh, to all sorts of crises at one area or another. And uh, occasionally, to be honest with you, I think the eyes come off the ball. Mm. But I think what we've got to understand is that it can't in this area. No matter what else you're doing, you've always, as President of the United States, got to pay attention to this area. Because keeping the American people safe is more important than... That's what we elect governments for. I mean, we've, we've, we've probably formed our first government when we were in caves because we were kind of to keep us safe from either animals or other people or tribes or what have you. So keeping it keeping us safe is about the first, to me, the first obligation of government. So no matter what, what else you're doing, I don't think you can let your eye distracted from that. I think Obama is a man, of president of great goodwill. I think he really wants to do a job in this area. He has the intelligence to do it. I think he's got to empower the DNI under him and give him whatever presidential authority he needs. Uh, and now we've got to move forward. Well, sir, thank you very much. I think one of the things we've all learned is we're very glad your eye is on this ball. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much, sir, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.